The la the actual launch is is at ten seventeen is when the launch window opens. So that's when the big show is going to be the the countdown and everything. <coughs> So we're doing that now as soon as we're live. we're live okay so we're live now as soon as you let the camera okay <laughs> all right good morning everyone good morning uh we're live this is kevin from pci geomatics um all right so welcome to uh gatineau quebec uh, we're located here at pci geomatics we're uh, broadcasting live on youtube uh, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm the Director of Marketing at PCI Geomatics and we're doing a live broadcast today to basically uh, uh, celebrate a little bit the launch of the RaiderSat Constellation mission. So uh, RCM is being launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base um, today in about 45 minutes from now at 1017 uh, Eastern Daylight Time is when the uh, launch is going to be, uh, the launch window opens up. Um, we're really excited about this. It's, a, it's an exciting day for Earth observation here in Canada. Uh, as you may or may not know, Canada has a long uh, uh, and storied past in using uh, developing radar technology uh, here, here in Canada and that's been used around the world. And uh, PCI has been a big part of that, developing software, going back to, uh, well, we're going to be interviewing our chief technology officer who has a much longer uh, institutional memory about what uh, PCI has done with radar technology over the years uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, so you'll hear all about that from David Stanley. Um, if we can switch to the, uh, the map view on the feed, I'll just show really quickly where the launch is occurring from. Um, so I'm just uh, trying to get a, a thumbs up here if we're seeing my screen right now. We should see the Google Maps uh, up on my laptop. So the launch today is uh, being provided by SpaceX. So SpaceX, uh, no introduction needed, uh, Elon Musk and so on, very uh, much in the news over, over the last uh, few years. Um, so if I just uh, zoom around here, you can see uh, basically we're located right now up here in Canada in Gatineau, Quebec. <laughs> and if I zoom down here, um, you can see basically that um, Los Angeles is just over here. And along the coast, about 300 kilometers up the coast, there's the Vandenberg Air Force Base. So you can see the Vandenberg Air Force Base here. And uh, if we go down a little bit, um, you can see that there's the um, Space Launch Complex, otherwise known as SLC-4E, which is a space pad that uh, SpaceX has actually been um, uh, leasing since 2015, I believe. And uh, what they're doing is they're launching uh, various rockets uh, from there. So the Falcon 9 is the rocket that's going to be used today. Uh, so for today's broadcast, we have a few things planned. We uh, basically want to give you a few key facts about RCM to begin. Um, and then we're going to interview some key experts. Uh, so I'm not sure if we can pan around the room and have a quick look right now. Um, so we have uh, a few people from PCI um, who have, have expertise in, uh, in our technology. Uh, we've got uh, Mazura Hussein, who's uh, going to be interviewed later. Uh, Guillaume just walked in. Guillaume is uh, going to be our first interview. We're going to talk about kind of rocketry and uh, why it's kind of exciting to, to, uh, to have SpaceX launching this mission. Uh, Gabrielle Gosselin is one of our SAR scientists, and Dave Stanley is our, our CTO. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of information about RCM uh, first. So let me um, just show a quick video here. So if we can switch to uh, my computer once again, I'll just uh, pause that for a sec. Uh, so you should see uh, the video feed now. So what you're seeing is basically the, um, the simulated launch. So this is a video that was produced by the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, it shows the actual RCM launch occurring uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, you, you can basically see the satellite entering into orbit. Um, we'll actually witness this live. That's the separation of the booster rocket, which is going to be recycled. We're going to get Guillaume to explain to us a little bit about how that works. Here we see the actual deployment of the three uh, radar sat satellites. So RCM-1, RCM-2, and RCM-3, which are then going to be uh, entered into their orbits. Uh, this is an animation showing the deployment of the radar antenna 
for one of the RCM missions and uh, you can see the solar panel uh, sort of tilted off to the side and the main module in the middle is the bus module um, which stores all of the, the um, computing elements and so on for RCM. Uh, here we see a simulation of how RCM, once it's in orbit and it's capturing data, uh, how it can collect data across the Earth. So there'll be three satellites uh, orbiting around, uh, they'll be separated uh, but they'll be on the same orbital plane, which uh, basically means that uh, we can get very rapid revisit within four days uh, for lots of new applications. Um, so if we, if we quickly uh, give you some facts here about the Radarsat program. So uh, the Radarsat 1, which was the first satellite that was launched uh, by the Canadian Space Agency, NMDA, which was the, the builder of the satellite, that was in 1995. The launch actually occurred at the Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, exactly in the same location where the launch is occurring today. Um, if we uh, fast forward to 2007, uh, so Radarsat 1 had a very long uh, duration in terms of its uh, utility. And in 2007, Radarsat 2 was launched. That launch occurred from Baikonur, which is located in Kazakhstan. Um, this launch is going to be provided by SpaceX, uh, specifically, as I mentioned, the Space Launch Complex, SLC-4E. Uh, and that's, that's an actual location in California, right by Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, which, uh, which is going to be, uh, there's a lot of people from CSA and uh, from Canada who are actually physically down there uh, today. Uh, we've got our, our Twitter page up. We've got some different feeds going on here. So you can probably see uh, some of the activity. Uh, we've got the SpaceX uh, user account. We've got the Canadian Space Agency RCM updates. Uh, so a lot of our colleagues are actually down in California right now, and they're live tweeting. So we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep an eye on that to see if there's interesting tweets coming. Um, RCM has had uh, some delays over the course of, uh, over the course of the last few months. Um, most notably, uh, this is due to Booster 1050. Uh, Booster 1050 was supposed to be used. Uh, so the whole idea with RCM is uh, through the use of SpaceX, it's a recycled rocket or recycled booster. Uh, and that was supposed to be Booster 1050, which went up on December 5th, uh, but that was a failed um, uh, recovery mission. So that booster was not available. So that introduced delays. Uh, CSA, MDA, and SpaceX worked together to identify an alternative plan. Um, and basically uh, what's going to be used is Booster 1051, which was successfully launched and relanded on March 2nd. And it's a really uh, exciting uh, mission that just occurred um, which was actually the um, Crew, Dragon, Crew Dragon Demo 1, so it was quite uh, prevalent in the news. It was actually launched from Cape Canaveral, and uh, I could just show you real quickly uh, where that was happening. So if I go over to, um, back to the, uh, to the, uh, back to the computer there. We'll just uh, get a video going here. So this, this is video of the actual booster rocket, which was launched from Cape Canaveral. Um, and then what, what, what actually occurred after that is the rocket was um, deorbited, uh, came back to Earth, and uh, uh, basically was recycled. So um, what you'll see here is that the actual rocket that's going to be used today landing on... Um, what is it called again? It's the called barge. Oh, the, uh, the barge okay. is called uh, I Still Love You, I think. Of course I still love you. Yeah, of course I still love you. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, the barge that was off the coast of uh, Cape Canaveral that was used. So that rocket was actually ferried uh, over uh, to the shore, loaded up and uh, brought to California, refurbished, and that's what's going to be used today. Um, so uh, the timeline today, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but uh, I'll just escape out of this video here. Uh, if I just bring up the timeline, hopefully you can see that. I'll just zoom in a little bit. Um, so we're at uh, T minus uh, roughly, what is it, 1017? So uh, roughly 30 minutes, let's say. Um, so we're, we're currently um, uh, in, in preparation stage. So Falcon 9 begins engine chill. That's going to be a T minus 7. Uh, the countdown is going to start uh, at roughly 10.15 or so. That's when the launch window opens up. Uh, the actual liftoff occurs uh, probably at 10.17. Uh, 
Um, and then there's, there's a series of uh, milestones uh, through the launch. So there's max Q, main engine cutoff. There's the separation of the, uh, the booster rocket and the deorbiting of it. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, an interview. So I'm just going to introduce real quick. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Guillaume. So uh, hopefully you can hear Guillaume. Hi. Um, so Guillaume Morin is actually uh, one of our uh, employees here at PCI Geomatics and uh, I would describe him as a bit of a space fan. Uh, definitely hear him talking a lot about SpaceX uh, in the kitchen at lunchtime and, uh, and, and so on. And uh, so I thought I would interview uh, Guillaume just quickly to ask a few questions. So Guillaume, um, so Vandenberg is being chosen as the launch location in California. Can you explain to us why typically that's chosen or why it's been chosen today? Yeah, of course. So the main reason is really safety. Uh, there's mainly two types of orbits we use uh, when launching satellites. As what we call an um, equatorial orbit, so basically going across the equator, go around. Uh, that is because the closer you are to the equator, the easier it is to launch something into space, because you, you benefit of the rotation of the Earth. But uh, when you're doing Earth observation satellites, what you want is to be able to cover as much Earth as possible. So you want to do uh, what's called a, a polar orbit or near polar orbit, which basically is uh, going from north to south and going around like that. And as the Earth rotates, you're basically going to revisit every part of the Earth, so almost every part of the Earth. Um, but launching ro ro rocket is a risky business. Oh, Sorry. is your mic working? It's not on mute, so it should be working. Maybe closer, hold it closer. Um, so launching rocket is a risky business, uh, which means that there's always failure is always an option. So if it fails, that means debris is going to fall back to us, and you don't want those debris to fall back on people. So <laughs> when, when you're launching from uh, from the equatorial orbit, uh, Florida is, is the best because there's giant water out west. So if the thing falls down, you're good. Vanderbilt is great because if you look at the map, it's basically going so I've just, from. I've just got the map up on the screen. I don't know if you can put that up, uh, Moro, just real quick. Uh, going from uh, north to south, south is basically the Pacific Ocean. So if something goes wrong, the rocket's going to fall in the water and nobody gets hurt. That's why Vandenberg is, is popular for our observation satellites. So, so as it launches, it actually goes Curves towards the Pacific to, Ocean, yeah. away from land. Yes. Right. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, tell us about Falcon 9. So what's so special about this rocket? Why is it such a <laughs> proven launcher Why, like for, for SpaceX? Well, it's, it's been a, a rocket that's been working for a very long time with. Uh, they have five different versions of it. Uh, and and the, less, the Block 5, which is the newest version, is we built a word reuse. Uh, so you know, as you mentioned before, they launched that launcher uh, in March and they're reusing in June, which is a very short time frame. Um, so that can save a lot of money because they don't have to build it from scratch. Mm -hmm. They just need to refuel it and refurbish it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a workhorse, right? So they can reuse it and make uh, a lot of launch. It's very cheap as mm -hmm. a result of that, everything. Yeah. Comparables. How many times they plan to reuse it? Like in, in the course uh, of... Uh, I think I heard same thing 20 times. 20 bef times. Before a major refurbish, right? Okay. So they, before they pull it apart entirely, replace things and reuse it over. So I don't know exactly how many times it's going to be reused, but you can say 20 times a safe uh, number. Cool. Um, I don't know if you, I'm not sure if you can go to my computer there for a sec, uh, Moro, but uh, I, I, I understand you're a bit of a geek, a space geek, and you, yep. play, you play this game. Um, so this is a game called uh, Kerbal Space Program. Uh, so I'm just going to launch a satellite here uh, real quick. I, I, I'm doing one of the tutorials and this uh, is like the go. baby rocket that's oh, super, go. super tiny. Uh, but I'm going to launch it here. Maybe you can, you can tell us what's going on. So yeah, the first thing you want to go is to accelerate. So go as fast because really going in orbit is going sideways very, very fast. That's really what it is. Um, so you basically keep falling and missing your Earth over and over again. Um, so I don't quite see what you're oh, doing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just launched the little baby rocket there. So, yeah. so I don't know. yeah. So this is actually not you, you're going to space, but not you're not going to do an orbit because you're going straight up. Okay. Uh, and if you're going straight up, well, you, at one point you're going to run out of fuel and you're going to go straight down, pretty close to where you started. That's right. not what you want. What you want is to go go up and then start sterning okay. as fast as you can, so you can get velocity, uh, speed, sideways, and and then go into orbit. So that would change the pitch or the uh, yaw? Yeah, so basically go up first a little bit because when you're low in the atmosphere, it's kind of hard and you want to get out of that. And then you turn okay. uh, either east, west, or I just, north. I just hit something and it's tumbling freely in space now. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I did the right thing. Uh, that's okay. As long as you're... Oh, yeah. Well, we'll see. 
It's going to fall back down. Now, I now. Have <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's insured, right? It's insured. Oh, exactly. good. Um, yeah, so that's uh, so it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I know I know this is a game and everything, but in terms of simulating, what tools do rocket scientists actually use to kind of plan all this out? Oh, it was a much more complex tool than that <laughs> for sure. But it's a fun game. I've, I've used it a lot. Uh, I actually started playing that game because it was uh, you had the possibility to actually send orbital engine satellites, which I find was cool because where we work. And I learned a lot about uh, orbital mechanics and how actually sending something to space is very hard. Right. Uh, and I think I'm about to crash here. It's yeah. Gonna crash exactly. in a second. Oh, oof. boom! There we go. There we go. <laughs> I don't know if you got that Portable or not. Portable but... Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's a it's it's a fun game. Uh, it's actually you learn a lot of things. There's an educational version of it. Right. Uh, it's it's a, it's a highly recommend. It's uh, cool. Well, thanks, Guillaume, for your insights. Uh, enjoy the launch. And we'll we'll see you soon. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to our next interview. So if I can ask uh, Dave Stanley to come up. Um, so. Uh, audio is okay. It's working. The mic's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so Dave, if you could just talk into the mic. Um, sure. How you doing, Dave? It's early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Dave hasn't had his coffee yet. I think he walked in and he came straight to this room. So, um, yeah. So Dave Stanley's our CTO. He's been with PCI, I think, since the very beginning. Uh, employee number one. 1981 uh, is when I joined. 1981. So David. Um, uh, David heads up our science team. So David, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, PCI Geomatics and its involvement in the RadarSat program, because my understanding is you know, PCI has played a role pretty much since the beginning. Yeah, when we were um, back in the, actually in the early 80s, when Canada was first thinking about launching a radar mm -hmm. satellite, the Canada Center for Remote Sensing was running a conveyor. Okay. An airborne aircraft with a sensor on it to sort of experiment with, you know, SAR data. Mm -hmm. And that's actually when we started working with them. The Canada Center of Remote Sensing, probably 1984, okay. something like that. I remember writing some of the first contracts to get money from CCRS back So that, that was an airborne sensor that yes. had multiple antennas. So you could do like X-band, C-band, L-band, simulate polarizations and so on. Kind of like the Rolls-Royce of of radar instruments. Yeah, I guess because you could actually get your hands on it once it's up in the air, you can't, I mean, in, in space. Right. But when it's on the ground, you can really play around with configurations. And so they were doing that to learn about what they wanted to put up in space. I, you know, back in 1984, we really didn't write the software to be too sophisticated, but mm -hmm. we did our first passes at that. Um, and then, of course, we started moving into uh, uh, when radar sat one was actually launched mm -hmm. there were a number of contracts that we got from them mm -hmm. we developed extra uh, capability uh at that point we also had uh after radar sat one there was envysat came up right yeah right? so yeah. we supported envysat from the european space agency yes, yeah exactly and then of course radar sat two mm -hmm. and after that we've also started to see a lot more radar satellites like uh what was palsar mm -hmm. and uh <coughs> terrasar x yep and, you know, Gabrielle, help me out here. Uh, uh, well, we have CompSat 5 Comsat from uh, 5. Korea, South Korea and Cosmos SkyMed from Italy. Right. And yeah, it's quite a few radar satellites. And some now, of them yeah. are multiples too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, constellations, yeah. And it's also very interesting to th think here when you start looking at the industry, the number of people who are actually talking about launching even more radar mm -hmm. satellites, mm -hmm. you know, Earth. Earth um, there's private yeah. private industry now that's kind of you know thinking of launching satellites like I know Capella is one that's based in California. The Canadian uh, Earthcast. Earthcast is uh, doing privately funded uh, space as well, and so it's a pretty exciting time. So, what do you think are the big milestones, Dave, in terms of what PCI has done over the years? Like, what what would in your mind stick out as the key technology that that's been developed here that's helped out the greater Sat community as a whole? Well, you know, if we go think about that, uh, I probably. 38 years to think about over that time. Yeah. I would certainly think that some of the big things I remember were uh, some of the first contracts we ever got to do some processing mm -hmm. for, for radar sat, all written in Fortran. Okay. <laughs> Back in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, but after that, um, 
So we, we did. We, I, I mean, I know the I know the history a little bit. So. Um, you know, like the initial satellites maybe were not as powerful as today, so there was limited things you could do. But I understand there was like some, some interest in generating elevation models in cloud-plagued areas. Like that was one of the key things sort of early on in RadarSat. So, tell, yeah. so there was some stereo radiogrammetry technology so developed? Some of the, and, well, first of all, you're quite right. Um, some of the basic stuff we put in, like um, the uh, beta knot corrections and things like that, that's mm -hmm. pretty straightforward stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did get into radar grammetry, where mm -hmm. you try to do stereo matching mm -hmm. uh, for el elevation extraction. That's really helpful in areas where you can't get uh, uh, optical data very well. Mm -hmm. That worked, but not as well as I would have liked. It was always difficult because the radar mm -hmm. data, when you're trying to match it that way, mm -hmm. uh, in a sort of a feature matching system there's a lot of noise sure. and a lot of layover and it really it's hard but so, we did it so a system constraint in terms of how the data is collected yes. and so on now, i understand there's been a lot of development and uh, one of the key things <clears throat> now is insar i guess that's one yes. of the latest and greatest technologies so, and so back then it was really hard to get an interferometric pair i mean there was one satellite with a really long baseline 24 day revisit and, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it was really hard and yeah. of course the the signal to noise ratio was poorer back then, the mm -hmm. resolution was worse, uh, the metadata and positioning of the satellite itself was really hard to understand. So INSAR was a, a black art back in the right. 80s and 90s. It so, really was. But today, mm -hmm. with all of the new satellites that are going up, the positioning is so much better. It, it's actually much easier now to do a really beautiful in, INSAR path. Uh, 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 DEM extractions and uh, subsidence maps. And it's it's beautiful to see some of the products that are coming out now. It's yeah. Tell us about the role of CSA. Like, I, you know, uh, I, I understand PCI invests in itself in terms of conducting R&D, but there's also uh, collaboration or, or funding from CSA for, for PCI and Canadian industry to develop technology. What, what, what's that been like over the years? And I would have to say that CSA has been extremely helpful to P uh, PCI. I've been mm -hmm. very pleased about the number of contracts that we've been able to win for that, and they've been extremely supportive of our ideas. So um, we've probably had RUDP, the RadarSat User Development Program, yep. and the EOADP, the Earth Observation Development the Program. The latest uh, generation of uh, funding for right. Earth Observation application. <coughs> yeah. And we've probably had about 10 contracts from them. Right. Um, over over a 20-year period. And it's been key technologies that we've Absolutely. positioned and developed, right? And Absolutely. The INSAR packages, the ability to do slant range to ground grain conversions, mm -hmm. uh, a number of the ones to do uh, multi, mm -hmm. to do data extraction, mm -hmm. polarimetric processing. Yeah, I understand even for, for today, for which is RCM, the technology was developed several years ago through EOADP and also our own funding. So uh, the ability to process compact polarimetry data, uh, I th what, was that 2016 or yeah. some, somewhere in there, I think is when that was released. So, um, so we're very ready for the RCM mission yep. here. I mean, the software, so many capabilities are there, have been developed over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. partly for RadarSat 2, a lot for RadarSat's Constellation mission when it comes up so that we'll have things on ready to go when this thing is live and start sending a commercial Cool. Data. Well, speaking of that, we're going to go live soon to the feed, so we want to get to the interviews. Absolutely. What are you most excited about? Just before you go, Dave, what are you most excited about for RCM? Daily coverage. Daily coverage. Just That's lots of data. Like lots big... of data, daily coverage, and then we start to put algorithms into extract information. That's one of the hardest things we've had so far with radar set data. Yeah. The lack? I would say the lack. The, the inability to do some really interesting uh, coverages on a daily basis or even weekly basis and monthly basis, to, to change that, inf that data to some useful information. And, I, and that's really where Masur comes in. Okay, well, we're going to talk to these two guys, so let, let me pass the mic over to Gabrielle next. Thanks, Dave. Enjoy the launch. Um, so, yeah, the launch is coming up pretty soon. Let's get through a couple more of these interviews real quick. Uh, so Gabrielle is one of our senior SAR scientists here at PCI Geomatics. How's it going, Gabrielle? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Um, so um, data is going to start being available pretty soon, um, probably within a couple of months after launch, once they get through the commissioning phase and so on. Can you give our viewers a bit of a sense of what that's going to look like? Like, how is the data going to be 
delivered, like in terms of its format, and what are people going to see when they load up data? Okay, of course, that's already depend on the observation mode, but basically, the RCM mission will be a little bit like Radar Sat 2 with lots of observation mode ranging from the very high resolution spotlight mode with a few meters resolution with a footprint of around 25 square kilometers. Mm -hmm up to the low resolution mode that will have a 100 meters special resolution yep. but that will cover 500 uh, 250,000 square kilometers right yeah so so um I, I mean the data format's changing a little bit but pci has developed technology so that it's kind of transparent for the user right like they just they run the same sar ingest algorithm and the data will be read in yeah there will be some differences because again that's depend on the processing level if right. we talk about ground range data mm -hmm. the data will be delivered as a tiff file okay single tiff file usually mm -hmm. one tiff file per parallelization mm -hmm. and they will always have like in case of radar set to ancillary information attached to the data so there will be like metadata files that will also have overview files calibration files but People will also have access to the single looks complex modes. I right. mean, the lowest processing level that will be obtainable by people. And for many observation mode, all the images will come into a series of small tiles called okay. burst. Right. And that will require a special pre-processing called right. the bursting. Okay. So you will need to take these uh, hundreds of small tiles and assemble it into a single channels. And this debursing mode now has been implemented in the Geomatica software. Okay. So, we're so is that already available? I, I know, I'm not sure if it's released or not, but I, I know the technology is already in yeah. our main development branch. So, um, so it, it, sorry. We, we took the simulators made by the Kazan Space Agency and with CCMEO yep. so to prepare ourselves mm -hmm. and before getting actual data. So we have simulated a lot of modes. So we wanted to know beforehand what was the structure and how to assemble those tiles, how right. to deep burst the image. So now all this work is ready. Okay. Of course, we will wait to get actual data to do some fine tuning, some yeah. fine tuning about the metadata, right. but all the infrastructure is there. So we're pretty much ready to That's great. Um, those data. And, and in terms, I mean, this, this is a compact polarimetry uh, satellite. Um, so maybe just walk us through a little bit like the difference there in terms of uh, how people are going to handle that data and what technology exists in PCI to handle compact pole data and how's that, how's that different? Compact polarimetry is basically two coherent channels. <clears throat> so now with the Sentinel mission, most people are used to the dual pole like right. position. So you will either have VV and VH or HH and HV. Mm -hmm. With the compact polarimetry is a little bit different in the sense that Got you will transmit, slide. in the case yeah. of the emission, you will transmit a circular polarization mm -hmm. and then you will receive two linear uh, polarization. And the main advantage of this kind of coherent acquisition is you will be collecting maybe not more information than compared to dual pole imagery, mm -hmm. but it's such a way that you can better approximate what you have in terms of diversity of emission from what we have with full quad. Because, of course, when we, if I look back at the Radar Set 2 mission, one of the great benefits for me of the Radar Set 2 mission was the fully polarimetric acquisitions. Right. Because I did lots of study using polarimetry. Mm -hmm. But even if you have a lot of in information with polarimetry, one of the main problems is the spatial coverage. Right. The small, small images. Yeah. yeah which is typically half the SWAT of the other equation mode. So this is really limiting for m lots of application. Right. So, so with this mission, uh, they've kind of um, limited the amount of, uh, uh, let's call it the, the, the different polarizations in the interest of having larger yeah. coverage on the ground. So compact polarimetry can be seen as a trade-off between the fully polarimetric imagery and the conventional dual pole imagery. Right. And uh, I understand you've done some work over the last few years and you've, you've, you've presented papers at various conferences. I'm just going to bring one slide up on the screen. Um, so this is basically showing kind of like a fully fine quad RaiderSat 2 image versus some products that could be generated with RCM in the future. Can, can you just kind of explain to us why, uh, what, what type of work this is? And Yeah, this slide just shows like the third EGAN value without going into the details. 
between different compact parametric mode and the fully parametric mode. Because we did a lot of things to prepare for the ERC mission in the support of compact polarimetry. And we have developed lots of uh, algorithms to support directly the compact polarimetry. That means decomposition that can be applied directly to compact polarimetry. But one of the objective of all the work we did here at PCI mm -hmm. was also to compare which information do we miss with compact polarimetry or how we can approximate fully quant imagery. Yeah. It was kind of more like theoretical studies. And we also have, let's say, algorithm to reconstruct pseudo polarimetric data from compact polarization. So and to make like decompositions yeah. and to Regular to look at the, the backscatter characteristics the same way we're used to with Raider Sat 2. Yeah. So actually in the software we can do really compact pole specific analysis or we can do pseudo polarimetric analysis. So it was both. Cool. Um, so we, we just got a few minutes left. So one last question. What are you most excited about with RCM? Data. Lots of data. So I won't say finally because research is still a thing that will be carry on. But for me, from one of the first time over Canada and we saw that with Sentinel-1, we will switch from like research to applications. Mm -hmm. So actually we'll be able to use all the science, sorry, science we did mm -hmm. in the past 10 years and go into actual application. And that's what will be amazing for like agriculture monitoring, wetland monitoring, uh, from first to application. Yeah, it was really exciting this week. I saw a video uh, that was produced by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. I'm not sure if you saw it. Yeah, saw uh, it. Some of our colleagues, Andrew Davidson and Heather McNairn. Um, yeah, and those are operational users and they're, 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 you know, they've done their research, they've deployed their operational uh, techniques, they've actually consulted heavily on this mission and how it should, how the data should be collected and they're they're going to be doing operational work, and, and they're, they're another example of an operational user, and there's more and more of them, yeah. And that will be really good, not only for people that work for different federal agencies and for people in the industry, but also imagine now people have access to all this imagery because it will be free online. So lots of people will benefit from that, and that will increase awareness of the importance of remote sensing. Awesome. I'm just looking at the, the, the countdown here. It looks like everything's a go. I didn't even check to see if everything was okay, but uh, it looks like T minus six minutes. We've got time for one more interview. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thank you. Um, so, Mazur Hussein. Uh, Mazur, how are you doing? Hey, Kevin. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, so, Mazur, um, just for our, our, our viewers, um, I understand that you've been developing technology uh, more around object-based image analysis and specific to radar. So maybe yes, tell us about yes. what you've been up to real quick. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty interesting. So most of the time, like... Maybe a little uh, bit closer, yeah. Object-based image analysis has been mainly geared towards the optical data. Yep. And uh, people have been trying to incorporate SAR data into the framework, which has uh, proven a little bit difficult because you have to do a lot of pre-processing. So what we started thinking like how we can make that thing streamline easy and more meaningful in, in the same um, environment and uh, in the same framework, which is gonna make a lot of uh, life for a lot of people much easier and they're gonna be happier. So a uh, couple of things that we had to uh, kind of uh, look into was that uh, SAR data is uh, mostly like uh, we use both phase and amplitude. Yeah. And uh, so, so just a quick question, yes. just a quick question. So. I mean, I understand the concept of region growing, and that's a key yes. part of object-based yes. yes. uh, segmentation. So, um, what have what has PCI done to address kind of like the inherent noise in the radar data to be able to apply a region growing al yes. algorithm? So, what we have done is we have taken the leverage of our pretty rich SAR algorithms to mm -hmm. automatically detect what type of SAR data it is. So sure. we've been analyzing the uh, metadata sensor and a whole lot of other information, including what sort of uh, channels they are. Mm -hmm. And then automatically um, exposing certain pre-processing within our framework uh, for a user to enable those pre-processing to... So things uh, like filtering? In, yes. So example, ad adaptive data, filtering? And yes, adaptive filter. And even the polarimetric uh, uh, components of the data that you can bring into right. the segmentation. Mm -hmm. So the segmentation now can take care of those uh, elements that you can just provide the, some pre-processing in the system and it will just take that thing in and mm -hmm. it will do it for you. And I think some of the work that Gabrielle was talking about, yes. he actually used the technology that's been developed to do 
uh, some of this uh, analysis for fire scar mapping. I yeah, think it was. That's, yeah, that's absolutely right. So he's been our uh, like a research scientist internally, and he's been evaluating our technology. So he has vetted our technology um, by applying it to a real problem, and it has proven to be a successful methodology. So we, we haven't kind of picked up things and read them, uh, but we have done some internal assessment carefully to pick up what is the best for different uh, scenarios and for different data types, okay. and then bringing that components within our framework. So I think that's the that's pretty key of how we have advanced in our technology. So where do you think this needs to go? RCM is going to have three satellites. They're yes. going to be constantly collecting data. Um, where do you see this going? Uh, it's challenging. I think there are going to be two main components. Uh, with this uh, enormous data being uh, collected and uh, uh, being gathered every day, there's going to be a huge challenge. How are we going to process it? Mm -hmm. and in terms of processing, the, uh, there are two components. One, you have to effic uh, efficiently process the data and have to extract the meaningful information. Mm -hmm. So I think the automation is going to be the key. Okay. So you have to, someone has to, we have to be unable to uh, run our process chain uh, that we might have developed based on certain, a few, a handful of data sets and then apply it to a whole large data set that's been collected in real time. Mm -hmm. or, so that's going to be a big challenge. How are we going to effectively transfer the knowledge that we have learned from one yeah. processing chain to the whole data set? And, and sort of the old way of doing things like image classification, yes. you know, a, a, a manual user going in and training classes and so on. That's kind of a thing of the past, past right? Yeah. Where, where yeah. are things going now and where do you see it going? Uh, what we are trying to understand is how we can uh, use the knowledge that we have uh, gained through some of the, uh, by using a handful of the data and then use that knowledge to the new data sets without retraining it. So mm -hmm. that will bring in the deep learning component. Okay. So uh, if you look at how the deep learning is being evol evolved uh, recently, mm -hmm. and um, mostly it has been geared towards the optical data. Uh, but we are internally assessing the technology and we are seeing how we can use the uh, deep learning technology um, uh, and see how we can learn it quickly and then transfer that knowledge to new data sets. So I think that's going to be the key to enable quick and real-time analysis of the data as we collect it. Awesome. I'm going to have to cut it off there because yeah. we're, uh, we're, like we're inside the we're one-minute mark. It's exciting. So, it's exciting. Uh, let, yeah, let's see how this goes here. Thank you, so, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Masur. Um yeah, so basically, uh, thanks for tuning in. We're going to probably switch to the, the live launch now. I'm going to stop talking, and we're just going to watch the launch. So let's uh, switch over to that tomorrow and enjoy the show. Stage two, pressing for flight. Falcon 9, radar set, go for launch and landing. T minus 30 seconds, stand by for the countdown. Stage one, pressing for flight. Falcon Eyes, get bigger for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Lift off to Falcon 9. The vehicle is pitching down range. Stage 1, propulsion is coming. As you just saw, Falcon 9 had an on-time liftoff through the fog from line. Vandenberg Air Force Base. Approaching max Q. Vehicle is supersonic. Vehicle is passing through maximum dynamic pressure.
We now have three events coming up in rapid succession. Main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start one, or SES one. All of these things you can follow along with uh, on the timeline at the bottom of your screen. Main engine cutoff coming up soon. This is where all nine engines of F9 will shut down. Trajectory is looking good. Stage, stage separation. And there on your screen, you can see that we have visual confirmation of main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start one. So on the left-hand side of your screen, we'll watch the first stage as it begins its return back to Vandenberg Air Force Base. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the second engine as it begins to carry the three radar sat satellites to sun-synchronous orbit. So boost back burn has begun. There you just saw fairing deployment. It's a pretty cool shot of the fairing flying away. And we have about 10 seconds left in the boost back burn. So the shot you see on your left is from inside the interstage. And boost back. Confirmation of boost back shutdown. So in order for stage the first stage to make its way back to landing zone one at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, it has to execute a series of three burns. The first, which you just saw, is what we call the boost back burn, and that helps to slow the rocket down and orient it for entry. Shortly after this, um, the grid fins, which you see right there, uh, articulating as they help steer the rocket back to Vandenberg, uh, those are deployed to help guide the rocket during its descent. Following that, Falcon 9 executes its entry burn, and that slows itself down before hitting the dense part of the atmosphere. the entry burn actually cuts the first stage speed almost in half. So that's what will be coming up next at about the T plus six minute mark. The third and final burn that stage one will execute today is the landing burn. Happens to be everybody's favorite burn and that takes place just before touchdown as the booster touches down softly on the ground. So if you happen to be in the greater Vandenberg Air Force Base area, um, I recommend that you head outside because you are very likely in range to experience the sonic boom that comes with re-entry. So at T plus five minutes now, we have confirmation that MVAC power is good. Trajectory is looking good. Despite the foggy view from this morning, everything is looking good. We are 10 seconds till entry burn.
Stage one, entry burn has started. Confirmation that stage one entry burn has started. So there on the left-hand side of your screen, you see the first stage as it's making its way back to landing zone one at Vandenberg Air Force Base with the help of the grid fins as it steers. The view on your right is the same operation that we have going on, just from a different camera. So there you can and see that we have confirmation of stage one down. entry barn shutdown. Stage two on the right hand side there, looking good. Everything is nominal and trajectory is good. Stage one FTS is safe. Slowly but surely, you can see the layer of fog reapproaching uh, on the left hand side as we have a view from the top of the first stage rocket looking down the rocket towards the stage engine one, section. section. You heard the call out for stage one transonic. Stage one landing burn has started. Landing burn has begun. Due to the fog, we might lose the video as it touches down, but stay tuned. Planning legs are deployed. Okay, there you can see. There you can see, again through the fog, but at least a little bit more clearly this time, Falcon 9 has landed at Landing Zone 1 back at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So with that good news, we turn back into second stage, our primary mission, stage as it continues to carry the three RadarSat Constellation satellites to sun-synchronous orbit. That's a shot of the MVAC nozzle as it burns Seco. through. And there we had confirmation of second engine cutoff, or SECO. So now we're just going to wait for confirmation of second stage good orbit. GNC confirms good first orbit insertion. All right, we have confirmation that we have a good orbit for a second stage. Now, we're about to enter a 40-minute coast phase, so we're going to take a break but we're leaving you with an animation that shows where we are in the coast phase. We'll be back at about T plus 49 and a half minutes for a second stage relay. Also signal Vandenberg as expected. Also signal Hawthorne as expected. Probably have to rotate the camera around there. Are you? Are you? Okay, so uh, yeah, so thanks for watching uh, our uh, quick little uh, commentary video. We got some excited PCI uh, staff here. Uh, it's been a, so come come on over here, everyone, because I think the camera only sees this side of the room. Should, should point out that lo previous launches had more people in the room. Now that you can do all this. Uh, uh, see it at your desk. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are watching at their desk in the company, so this is not everyone in the company, obviously. <laughs> and we have other offices in Toronto as well, so there's people watching there as well. But uh, So thanks, uh, everyone, for watching our, uh, our quick little commentary uh, show today. And uh, enjoy the rest of the launch. We'll, uh, hopefully everything works well. At about, uh, in about uh, half an hour or so, there'll be the uh, engine startup again for the, uh, for the final placement of the, uh, the orbiting of the rocket. So thanks very much. Yep. You can see that in our final review meeting, huh? Sorry.